surely wherever they sell quality books, you will find this wonderful edition by Peter. I'm Michael Vendetta, I'm the Executive Director of the Council, and on behalf of my colleagues, Eric Kubik and Rachel Brooks, and the Board of Directors of the World Affairs Council of Western Michigan, I welcome all of you. Thank you for adjusting with us as we program responsibly in this time of COVID-19. We hope you stay safe and you show grace to those in your community. Council's mission is to empower the people and organizations of Western Michigan to engage thoughtfully with the world. We do this with the help of nearly 50 local companies, 11 educational partners, and many community members. Together, we seek to provide programming that is credible, objective, relevant, civil, and compelling. To change the world, we believe, one must first know the world. And you can learn more at worldmichigan.org. We're pleased to offer this program on the history of the Chinese diplomatic corps and how we might interpret Chinese diplomatic strategy during this strained time of US-China relations. And this is part of our continuing effort this fall to discuss all things China. Our format today is straightforward. We'll hear some opening comments from Peter and then have the chance to engage him in conversation. And uh, we hope that you will join us in doing that. And you can do it by typing in your messages to the YouTube chat commentary box, or you may text them to 616-481-9569. That's 616-481-9569. And we ask you to remember our house rules to council to ask your questions respectfully and succinctly. Now, let me introduce our guest this afternoon, Peter Martin. He is Bloomberg's defense policy and international reporter in Washington and author of China's Civilian Army, The Making of Wolf Warrior Diplomacy. He was previously based in Beijing, where he wrote extensively on the escalating tensions in the U.S.-China relationship, and reported from China's border with North Korea and its far western region of Xinjiang. His writing has been published by outlets including Foreign Affairs, The Atlantic, Foreign Policy, the National Interest in The Guardian, and he holds degrees from the University of Oxford, from Peking University, and the London School of Economics. Welcome, Peter Martin. Welcome, Peter. Thanks so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to, to do this. Peter, we'd just like you to uh, share some of the concepts that you bring up in your book. I found it in incredibly fascinating. I mean, I don't, some of these stories that you were able to uh, uncover and tell uh, were amazing and uh, uncovered a lot of things that helped me understand the history and, and current uh, operations of Chinese diplomacy. But tell us a little bit about how you got started on the book, what gave you that idea, and some of the key concepts of the book, and then we can get to Q&A. Terrific. Well, uh, you know, thanks again. And I, I really do appreciate the, the warm welcome and the, the chance to interact with everyone today. Um, so maybe maybe I'll start out by sort of talking about how I came to write the book and then, um, you know, get on to some, some of the key findings and, and leave plenty of time, um, as you said, for, for Q&A at the end. Um, so I, I guess this, this whole project really started out when I arrived back in China in early 2017. I'd been away for a few years um, in India and then in, in Washington. And, you know, it was hard not to be struck on, on arriving back there by just the, the sheer scale of the economic, technological, military progress that, that China had made. President Xi Jinping was busy rolling out the Belt and Road Infrastructure Initiative across the world. China's economy was beating analysts' expectations. Um, the Chinese military was was just getting ready to, to launch its first um, overseas base in Djibouti um, and was you know, also engaged in militarizing artificial islands it had built in the South China Sea. Um, but, you know, at that time, perhaps the, the most important and significant opening that China seemed to have was the, uh, the vacuum that many people felt the Trump administration was creating. Um, which was, of course, at the time, busy picking fights with US allies, um, was very skeptical of, of multilateral organizations. Um, and there was this feeling in, in Beijing and beyond that there was this opportunity 
for China to kind of step up and take on a global leadership role. Uh, but I, I, I guess what was most striking to me about my time there, just watching China as this opportunity unfolded, was the way in which China actually really struggled to, to step into that vacuum. Um, you know, the it, it, its, its diplomats seem to end up kind of alienating other countries, its policies continue to be incredibly controversial, uh, its domestic crackdowns uh, continue to pace, and, and, and somehow, despite this huge opening, China seemed um, unable to take advantage. So I was, I was kind of curious about, you know, why was that? Why was this country that was so effective with its kind of hard power, uh, the economic military side of things, um, why was it so ineffective at that power to persuade? And it struck me that actually this is, this is kind of a crucial question in the, 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 the type of world that we're moving into. Um, as, as US dominance kind of slowly recedes and, and we, we enter a, a world where there are multiple competing power centers, there's going to be a real premium on the ability to make your case to the world to persuade others that it's, um, it's in their interests to, to follow a course of policy that you favor. Um, and the, the more I kind of delved into that theme, the more I came to see really Chinese diplomats as a, as a microcosm of Beijing's broader inability to persuade others. Um, and they, they, they kind of attracted me as a, as a group of people to study in particular because they're in this remarkable position where they have to kind of cohabitate two worlds at the same time. There's the closed secretive world of Chinese politics, and there's the more open and kind of rarefied world of international diplomacy. Um, and, 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 you know, when you meet them on a personal level, they can be suave, funny, sophisticated. They've studied at some of the best schools in the world. They've lived for decades overseas, many of them. Um, but when they sit down across the table for bilateral discussions with their, their foreign counterparts, um, or they stand up on the podium to do press conferences in the in the foreign ministry, they can suddenly turn, you know, very stilted, uh, quite ideological, and in recent years, of course, um, increasingly uh, a a aggressive and, and abrasive. Um, so I, I started to kind of look into well, where does this system of, of Chinese diplomacy come from? What are the rules that make it tick? Um, and what are the motivations for for Chinese diplomats. And I was conducting interviews in, in Beijing as part of my job with both Chinese officials, but also with, with foreign diplomats who spent much of their time interacting with the Chinese side. But, but most importantly, I came across this collection of more than a hundred memoirs by former Chinese diplomats, which kind of told their story um, from you know, 1949 all the way through to um, pretty close to the present day. Um, most of these memoirs had never been used before in the in the study of, of, of Chinese foreign policy, and um, certainly they'd never been used to kind of try to get insight into the, the inner life of, of, of Chinese uh, envoys. So I, uh, I kind of started mining them for details and really used that as the basic source base for the book. And, and, and when I started out, this was a, you know, a reasonably niche topic, um, which I expected to be of interest largely to um, kind of foreign policy geeks, uh, China foreign policy geeks. But uh, as, as the years rolled on, there were just these extraordinary outbursts by Chinese envoys storming out of international meetings, telling foreign counterparts to, to shut up. Uh, bursting in one case into the office of, of a foreign country's foreign minister, getting into a fist fight in Fiji uh, and spreading um, conspiracy theories about the origins of, of COVID-19. And, and we had this term wolf warrior diplomacy emerge as a way to describe the actions of, of Chinese diplomats. And so it really went from a kind of... Um, you know, relatively niche topic into something that was front and center of the way that policymakers in the US and beyond were thinking about China's behavior and China's intentions. But I guess as the world came to think um, about a, 
about this, you know, this the, the, this diplomatic behavior and approach. The the thing that really struck me, um, having spent all of this time with with the memoirs, was that while wolf warrior diplomacy seems very new on the surface, actually its roots go back a very long way. Indeed, they go back all the way to the start, the, the founding of the People's Republic of China in 1949. When the PRC was founded by Mao Zedong, um, the country basically had no diplomats to speak of. Most of the, the previous nationalist government's diplomats had fled to the island of Taiwan. Uh, those who had stayed behind were considered too ideologically impure to represent the new regime. Um, and, and, and the new government faced this kind of paradoxical challenge. You know, on the one hand, this was a government led by a uh, you know, a, a paranoid political party, which had spent most of the last few decades underground launching this, this kind of um, covert insurrection and, and often being chased and, um, and persecuted for doing so. Um, you know, so this, this movement was, was highly obsessed with secrecy, was worried constantly about outside threats to its legitimacy, even after it took control of Beijing, it was thinking about you know, the new superpower in the world, the United States, which was increasingly anti-communist. It was thinking about a rival government on Taiwan, which wanted to invade and, and, and take back its position as uh, the leaders of China. So, so there was that kind of closed paranoid um, mentality, but there was also this strong need to build bridges with the outside world and to win friends and to, and, and to build influence. And you know, ultimately to establish the communists as the legitimate rulers of China in the eyes of the world. And so to kind of square that circle, the PRC's first foreign minister, a man called Zhou Enlai, who really is the, the, the founding father of modern Chinese diplomacy, he came up with this idea that, that Chinese diplomats should think and act like the People's Liberation Army in civilian clothing. So they would be uh, unfailingly loyal to the Communist Party. They would be disciplined to a fault, and they would display what Zhou called a fighting spirit as they protected China's interests around the world. And, and, and that kind of martial militaristic ethos um, really resulted in a set of quite distinctive behaviors um, which were visible in 1949 and, and many of which continue to be visible today despite all of the, the profound changes that have, have taken place in China. Um, so typically Chinese diplomats would, uh, would stick closely to talking points, even if they know that those talking points don't resonate with people across the table from them. They move around in pairs in order to keep tabs on each other they will sometimes shout at foreign counterparts if they're concerned that, that failing to do so might make them look weak back home. Um, and they'll elevate even the smallest of, of perceived slights, sometimes into major international incidents um, because they worry that failing to do so might make them look disloyal by, by those watching them in Beijing. Um, and, and so this, this kind of approach led to what we would now call displays of wolf warrior diplomacy right from the outset, especially at times of domestic uncertainty. So in 1950, uh, Wu Xiuquan, who was this veteran revolutionary soldier who, whose face was kind of marked with a bullet scar, uh, he, he led a delegation to the United Nations in New York. And he delivered a speech which honestly makes today's wolf warrior diplomats look like a bunch of wimps. Um, Time magazine described it as two awful hours of rasping vituperation, which gives you some, some sense of the, the mood that Wu was able to, <laughs> to generate in the room. Um, in the 1960s, during the Cultural Revolution, Chinese diplomats um, handed out copies of Mao Zedong's Little Red Book on the streets of foreign capitals. Uh, they were expelled from countries ranging from Indonesia to, to Kenya. And uh, actually outside the Chinese representative office in London, Chinese diplomats literally fought with protesters on the street. And one of them was pictured wielding an ax um, as, <laughs> as he confronted uh, those who, who, who disagreed with what China was doing. 
Um, so those kind of wolf warrior instincts um, have been with us for a very, very long time. But it's it's really important to, to keep those instincts in the, in the context of another tendency in Chinese diplomacy, which I think is equally important. And this is the, um, the prerogative to, 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 to win friends and to build influence. And, you know, when China's top leaders have decided that um, that is the priority, then Chinese diplomats have, have been capable of taking that extraordinary discipline that Zhou and Lai um, demanded of them and, and using it to launch extremely successful charm offensives around the world. So in the 1950s, Chinese diplomats, um, you know, facing deep skepticism from across the, the non-aligned world in the Cold War from, from developing countries in, in Africa and Asia, um, launched uh you know a, a a a real push to kind of change minds and to win friends for china and that that kind of culminated in in Zhou and lai attending the 1955 bandong conference um in which he set aside ideological um you know controversies he set aside the status of taiwan and really focused on on expanding china's circle of influence outside the soviet bloc in the 1990s in the aftermath of the the Tiananmen massacre, Chinese diplomats launched a, a kind of two decade charm offensive, which um, you know, aimed to, to blunt some of the, the criticism after Tiananmen and, and ultimately culminated in Beijing hosting the 2008 Summer Olympic Games. So I kind of think of there being uh, two tendencies in Chinese diplomacy, which, which cycle in and out. There's, uh, there's, a, there's a tendency to, to kind of charm the world and there's a tendency to, to use wolf warrior tactics to tell the world off. And I think that recently we've seen a, a, a pretty decisive lurch back toward that kind of combative, abrasive assertiveness that I mentioned earlier. Um, and I think that, that that has been driven really by two things. Um, one is a, is a new confidence on the part of China and its leadership. And, and the other is um, enduring insecurities, which, which have their roots in um, China's political system ultimately, but have been exacerbated by um, Xi Jinping and his, his, his policies. So the, the new confidence really started around 2008 um, as the, the global financial crisis got into full swing. Chinese leaders looked around the world and they, they saw the, the kind of slow, uh, you know, in some ways sluggish response um, from, from US and especially European policymakers to that crisis. And they con contrasted that with their own ability to launch a, a massive domestic stimulus package. And they started to think, you know, we have been so deferential um, to Western governments for so long. We've kind of been in learning mode. But, but maybe it's our system that holds up to scrutiny and maybe it's not the system of the West. And that, that helped lead to, I think, a couple of years of really quite assertive diplomacy on China's periphery. But that, that assertiveness um, kind of became more consistent and frankly more assertive uh, after Xi Jinping became Communist Party boss in late 2012. And under Xi, uh, China's political system has become an increasingly tense, and if you're on the inside, even a, an increasingly scary place. Um, she has uh, launched a, a sweeping anti-corruption campaign in which 1.5 million officials have been punished. He has abolished presidential term limits, setting himself up potentially as leader for life. He has experimented with re-education camps in far western Xinjiang, um, and he's focused on ideology at home, and many of his speeches have kind of displayed hostility toward the outside world. Um, and, and when Chinese diplomats see these signals, they know exactly how to interpret them. Um, they know that in the past, and, and, and some of them even remember that in the past, um, the Chinese foreign ministry has experienced multiple rounds of purges in which colleagues were encouraged to inform on each other. Um, and in, in the Cultural Revolution, things got so bad that junior Chinese diplomats locked their ambassadors, Chinese ambassadors, in cellars. They forced them to clean toilets. Um, in some cases, they beat them until they coughed up blood. And 
large numbers of Chinese diplomats were even sent off to re-education camps themselves at the tail end of the Cultural Revolution. So they, they know exactly how high the stakes can be if they get on the wrong side of the Chinese political system. And I think all of this helped to set a new tone for Chinese diplomacy. You know, Chinese diplomats watched President Xi as he made speeches about how China was moving closer and closer to the center of the world stage. He said China stood tall in the East. He said that his political project for the country was about the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. And he, he warned that China would never give up an inch of its territory um, to foreigners and that it would never tolerate being bullied on the world stage. And if you have in the back of your mind, you know, that, that the kind of changes that are going on in Chinese politics and the kind of insecurities that might create for you, um, then, then you're going you're gonna to do your best to, to mimic that tone from Xi. And if you're feeling ambitious, maybe you'll add a little extra combative assertiveness just for, just for good measure. Um, and so this new approach really went into high gear after the coronavirus um, outbreak. China was, you know, on the one hand, under attack for its role in, in covering up the origins of the virus. But, but once again, it also felt like its system had been vindicated. After all, um, the virus spread in, in the US uh, and in many European countries um, uh, for far longer and with a far higher death toll um, than in China, even accounting for for um, inaccuracies in, in the official Chinese numbers. And so again, they felt like, you know, we're under attack here, but, but perhaps, uh, perhaps we have something to be proud of in our system. Um, and, and that led to a kind of series of dramatic outbursts that I alluded to at the start, um, apparently cheered on by President Xi, who apparently issued a handwritten note um, to the foreign ministry calling for more fighting spirit from Chinese diplomats. Um, Foreign Ministry spokesman um, Zhao Lijian has kind of become the face of this new generation of, of wolf warrior diplomats. He was a, a relatively obscure figure who uh, was posted to Islamabad, but, but managed to get himself into a Twitter fight with former US National Security Advisor Susan Rice. Um, and, and, and that incident rocketed him to domestic stardom. Um, and resulted in him being promoted and appointed to, to foreign ministry spokesman, making him one of the most high profile Chinese diplomats in the world. Um, and, you know, Zhao has uh, angered pretty much everyone who has, has come across his path. Um, he upset the Australian government when he, he posted a, an illustration of a um, Australian soldier holding a, a knife to the neck of an Afghan child. Um, and, and perhaps most provocatively, he caused um, you know, huge consternation in, in President Trump's Oval Office when he suggested that the US Army had deliberately spread COVID-19 in Wuhan, kicking off the, the pandemic. But you know, Zhao, while he's the most high profile of these people, he's actually accompanied by a whole cast of characters who have embraced this new approach. Gui Tongyo, who just, just left Sweden as, as, as China's ambassador there, um, was summoned to the country's foreign ministry 40 times in the space of two years. And he said in a, in a media interview, when he was asked about um, his behavior, that he said, for our friends, we have fine wine, and for our enemies, we have shotguns, um, which gives you, gives you some sense of how much he likes this new approach. Um, and it's, you know, it's crucial, I think, to remember that not everyone in China's diplomatic circles likes this. Uh, Yuan Nansheng, who was China's former ambassador, uh, was a former consul general in, in San Francisco, has warned about a trend toward extreme nationalism in Chinese foreign policy that risks alienating others. And even, even President Xi himself, in a Politburo study session, earlier this year, um, talked about the need for China to cultivate a lovable image um, in the world, which I think is at least a, a modest recognition that China, um, and especially Chinese diplomats, have, have come across often as a little bit more frightening than lovable in recent years. Um, but, you know, as I was saying, anyone who has delved into the history of PRC diplomacy knows that this kind of fighting spirit that we've seen recently is in many ways part and parcel of the DNA of the Chinese foreign ministry. 
um, and it, it's been there right from the start. So maybe I'll, I'll pause there and, um, and we can get going with um, some discussion. And thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Thank you, Peter. Uh, just fascinating. And um, you mentioned a couple of the stories that, uh, uh, that come from your book, and there are many more of them in here that uh, kind of uh, support your thesis on this that are just amazing. Um, we in West Michigan had the experience of having the former Chinese ambassador to the United States, Ambassador Shui, Shui Tenkai, uh, as our guest. Excuse me. And um, he um, had dialogue with uh, the former NATO ambassador, Nicholas Burns. In fact, they were classmates at Johns Hopkins School of Diplomacy. So I knew each other first name. But what was fascinating for our audience here in West Michigan is to watch them as diplomats banter back and forth, talk about the difficult issues between the countries, give a response, um, and uh, not give an inch necessarily, but but you know make sure the points were taken. In fact, the Bashir Shui, I felt as the as the as the uh, afternoon went on, was was starting to win some uh, folks in the audience who were coming into that uh, event skeptical of Chinese diplomats. He, he did a masterful job. And um, I'm wondering is, now that was just a few years ago, three years ago or so. So is Ambassador Shui just um, maybe um, one of those diplomats who are, whose influence is waning um, and he's not part of that wolf warrior thing. He's more part of the charm offensive. Or, I mean, how do you how do you connect that and what you see going on? Because you you did mention that there is some uh, dissension within the diplomatic corps about this trend. Yeah, um, it's a great question, and 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 Tway, I think stands out as one of the most um, talented diplomats of his his generation in China, um, and is someone who has has been capable of forging. Um, Pretty, pretty good relationships with people um, in the US and, and, and actually across much of Asia as well. Um, I, I tend to think of wolf warrior diplomacy not so much as, you know, there's a cohesive group of wolf warriors and then there are people who, who never use these tactics at all. I, I think of it much more as a tactic, which is available to some Chinese, to, to all Chinese diplomats and, and they can deploy as they see fit. And, you know, if you look at, Tsui's career, he has definitely spent much of his time charming others and seeking to persuade them. But, you know, when he needs to get tough, there are accounts of him, you know, dealing with, um, with, with Kurt Campbell, for example, in the, in the Clinton administration, and just going kind of red in the face and shouting when he needs to. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that that's his default, but he certainly can go wolf warrior when he thinks that's, the, that's what's called for. And, and like other Chinese diplomats, he, he is capable of extraordinary self-control um, when he does deploy those tactics. It's almost never out of um, a loss of control. It's about what, is the, what does the moment need? Uh, you know, having said that, I think that uh, certainly he didn't um, he didn't adopt wolf warrior tactics to anywhere near the same extent as um, as many others. And in fact, when Zhao Lijian suggested that COVID nineteen had been spread by the U.S. Army, Tsui publicly distanced himself from that. He didn't he didn't di uh, he didn't directly criticize Zhao, but he showed light between their positions, which is a very, very rare thing in the Chinese system. Generally they're excellent at speaking with one voice. Um, and I think and, and and you know I understand that he also let it be known through through various back channels in Washington that that, that was not the official stance of the, the Chinese government. Um, and so, so I think he was uncomfortable about it. And I think there are a lot of people in Chinese diplomatic apparatus who don't like this new approach. And, you know, I, I, I guess, unfortunately, from their perspective, they don't feel particularly empowered to, to speak out about it. And I think that the, the, the real reason for that is that the, the assumption is that Xi Jinping quite likes the new tough approach. Um, and so they don't have a, a tremendous amount of political cover. But, but like I said, you know, Chinese, it, China's kind of approach to this has, has gone in cycles over time. And there may well come a point um, in the future when the, the kind of charm offensive um, mode takes over. Interesting. 
Uh, you can uh, join the conversation by uh, typing in a question to the U in the YouTube uh, comments section, or you can text them to 616-481-9569. Peter, a question from one of our listeners. Um, is, is this unique uh, in terms of China using a strategy among great powers? I mean, do other countries do the same kind of thing? Or in your estimation, uh, viewing the the global diplomatic scene is this is trying to particularly unique in this or are they uh, they push this harder i mean do other countries employ this kind of uh you know charm versus aggressive approach yeah i mean i think i think there's there's good cop bad cop in every country's um diplomacy um there are reasons which I'll, I'll get into in a second that I think it's more likely to occur in China. But you know, uh, North Korean diplomats certainly will engage in in pretty provocative tactics. Um, in the Cold War, Soviet diplomats um, were capable of of doing the same thing, and indeed did so with their Chinese counterparts um, in a in a series of completely bizarre exchanges in the in the nineteen sixties, um, where they 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 bickered and shouted at each other over the the details of what it meant to be a good communist um and you know democracies too to some extent um can engage in this stuff i i think that um there are certainly a lot of people in, in i mean i remember talking to people in beijing during the trump administration who said well you know if we're wolf warriors then what is mike pompeo and you know that there, there, there was a concerted um approach that uh that, that kind of played out and was was um, badly received in many parts of the the world, um, whatever we think of its its um, its merits. So, uh, but I, I think that the, the 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 key difference is that in the Trump administration, it was really political appointees who engaged in that kind of stuff on the whole. Um, the, the professional US foreign service made up of nonpartisan, um, uh, you know, uh, bureaucrats uh, did, did not do that. They, they, they followed the messaging that they were given from the administration, but they tended not to engage in those tactics. And I think that's part and parcel of having a political system which um, is, or having a bureaucracy which does, is designed to be responsive to to different parties as they cycle in and out of power over time. And it has a set of um, professional objectives, which um, are broader than, than the objectives of any single administration. Now that's not really the case in China. Um, most members of the foreign ministry, I don't know the, um, the figures, but I suspect it's a very, very high proportion are members of the communist party. Um, and certainly the, the, the top levels of, um, of the Chinese foreign ministry are, and they feel compelled to respond to um, political changes in a way where there aren't those kind of um, professional checks. And so I think that helps to explain that when the why when the political winds change in China, the foreign ministry moves so decisively in the direction of that, that political win, whereas I think you know members of the Trump administration sometimes find it frustrating that they couldn't they couldn't move U.S. diplomats with quite the same speed, and I think that's a function of of, of the, the different types of political systems. So maybe it's not unique to China, but certainly among among great powers at the moment, I think um, it is pretty distinctive at least. I just got a, uh, a listener with something in the YouTube chat, and and you you were just in the middle of talking about this about. Uh, the Trump administration's attitude towards China, and there was sort of maybe some bullying going back and forth. Did that did that feed this wolf warrior diplomacy? But um, so what what might a U.S. approach, a diplomatic approach, be that is a um, a reasonable counter to what? Is there a counter to wolf warrior diplomacy? If 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 uh, trading insults back and forth doesn't get us that far, and there's one bully on one side and one bully on the other, um, what what might be an effective approach uh, to handling this kind of aggressiveness in diplomacy? Yeah, um, so I think you know there, there's kind of a school of thought among some 
China watches that um, uh, the US kind of caused Wolf Warrior diplomacy by pushing China too hard. I think that that line of thinking is, is, is probably um, at best incomplete, um, is I guess the way I want to phrase that. Um, I think there's no doubt that um, China felt put into a corner by the Trump administration and they felt threatened by um, the use of tariffs um, and they especially felt threatened by um, some of the language that Secretary of State Michael Pompeo used um, about China. And it was, you know, I sat in these briefings in the foreign ministry and it was really striking if we ask the foreign ministry questions about President Trump, they would respond with very strong words about US policy, but they would always refrain from criticizing the president directly. Um, and, and often they would even stress that, that President Xi and President Trump had a close personal friendship, just as, just as Trump would do the same in Washington. Um, but if we ask, right, you know, yesterday, Mike Pompeo said this, do you have any comment? they would launch into these just extraordinary kind of passionate personal attacks on him, which is just pretty incredible if you think about it, given that the State Department is their, their primary interlocutor in the US um, and that, that, that Pompeo may one day run for the Republican nomination. Um, but I think that the reason that they did that is because Secretary Pompeo kind of went further than most Trump administration officials in his criticisms of China and, and leveled criticism directly at the ruling legitimacy of the Communist Party. And that for China is the reddest of red lines. And when they saw him doing that, I think Chinese diplomats felt like they had no choice but to respond with incredible passion and vigor and to show that they were loyally defending the, the government's um, interests. So I, I do think to that extent, there's a case for saying that US actions and, uh, exacerbated it. But then how do you explain the, you know, the use of wolf warrior diplomacy in Venezuela, Brazil, Fiji, Papua New Guinea, uh, the, you know, the incredible uh, anger shown towards the Canadians, the Australians, the British, the French, you know, it's that's the, is that can you pin all of that on the Trump administration? So, so I think it's a it's a part of the picture, but it's it's just one part. Um, and in terms of of coming up with an approach, I think there is there is kind of something that's starting to emerge. I think um, if you look at the like the Pew polling of, of countries around the world, it's clear that China's behavior, including wolf warrior diplomacy, has done pretty severe damage to um, the country's reputation overseas. And I think a lot of people feel like, well, you know what, if they want to behave in that way, um, then let them do it. And uh, there's probably not too much that we need to, to do. And I certainly think that uh, it's hard to make a case that others need to start acting like that because, uh, you know, otherwise the effect would be that their, their reputation suffered um, part and parcel of that. But on, on a kind of more granular tactical level, it's, it's striking, I think, if you think of the March meeting between um, the Chinese foreign minister and, and, st and state count and, um, and Politburo member Yang Jiechi with Tony, Secretary of State Tony Blinken and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. The format of that in, in, in Anchorage, Alaska, and the, the format of that meeting allowed for opening comments in front of the media. And Secretary Blinken, I think, spoke for two or three minutes, and his Chinese counterpart followed up with a 17-minute intervention um, where he, you know, he said the US had no right to criticize China. And it was just this kind of extraordinarily brazen diatribe. And I think that um, the US side has decided that that in the future, they don't want that kind of, they don't want to provide that kind of platform for Chinese politicians to behave in that way. And so the, the recent meetings, um, Switzerland between top officials from the two countries uh, did not beat your opening remarks to the press in, in, in that manner. And so I, I think it's a combination of, you know, let them, let them do damage to their own image, but also let's not, let's not set up photo opportunities where US officials are being shouted at by Chinese counterparts because of the, the domestic optics of that are not too good.
Oh, sorry, Michael, I'm having a little trouble uh, hearing. I think he might be muted. Yeah, I'm uh, checking about some of the questions here. And, and again, Peter, you just uh, had somebody asking about the, uh, the conversation in Alaska with Secretary Blinken and uh, Director Sullivan. So um, uh, that, that was perfect. Um, a question about the, uh, the, the latest case of the Chinese tennis player, uh, Ping Shui, is that her name? Yeah. And yeah. that seems to be an example of uh, this kind of hardline diplomacy that's backfired. That's a question from one of our viewers. Is that because that seems to be playing out fairly negative in, on the world stage? But um, is that of any connection to you know, the, the current diplomatic stance of the country? I, I would tend to think of that case as more, more of a kind of classic example of um, the way that China tries to deal with, um, with, with domestic dissent and, 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 and how that plays out when it gets caught in the crosshairs of international opinion. So when, when um, the allegations kind of emerged from her, her social media account about a, 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 a former very senior Chinese politician, Zhang Gaoli, um, their approach was to kind of shut that down, to remove all discussion of it. And then, um, of course, it's been very unclear exactly what her status has been since, whether it's some form of, of house arrest or, or something else. And, um, you know, if she was a less high profile person, um, I think it's, it's pretty likely that she would have just disappeared into the obscurity and no one would have paid too much attention. Um, but but the, the, the government in Beijing kind of needs to show the world that she's fine, but also get this, what, you know, from its perspective, threat to its ruling legitimacy silenced as quickly as possible. And so what they're doing is this, this kind of difficult dance where there's, um, first of all, you shut down the perceived national security threat. And second of all, you try to limit the, the reputational blowback. And the parts of the Chinese state, I mean, I don't know that any part of the Chinese state is that great at public relations, but the, the security parts of the Chinese state are especially bad at it. And I think that that, um, you know, that's, that's not what they're trained to do. And uh, they, they can be a little ham-fisted in their approach. And so I think that's kind of what we're seeing play out. And in, in truth, I think that those instincts are so hardwired into the Chinese system that I think that something like this probably could have taken place under any of Xi Jinping's um, predecessors as well. And it's, uh, it's just part and parcel of how the system works. Um, and, uh, you know, this was just a very high profile case. Uh, um, uh, there's a follow-up to that one is that are, are they a little um, then a bit tone deaf in how this plays out, especially for a business, global business line. So American businesses looking at this situation, uh, they get pressure put on, correct? They, they get pressure put on if they are uh, still continuing their business in China and, and dealing with um, a country where this uh, situation with a tennis player can happen. And so, are, so uh, is this a matter of the internal, uh, the Chinese internal agencies not taking that into account uh, and not figuring there'll be blowback from this uh, and then not being corrected by the, by the head of the government? Or uh, do they see this connection that goes on between what, what they do and a business, a business reaction to it? I, I'm sure that they understand that there, there might be kind of secondary repercussions in terms of China's international reputation, in terms of business confidence. Um, but with the Chinese government, it's always, you know, domestic political stability is priority kind of one through 10 um, and everything else is, is secondary to that. And so while they understand that there may be repercussions, from their perspective, I think they just want to get this threat neutralized as quickly as possible, and then they'll do some damage limitation on the sides. But um, but really, you know, for the for the government as a whole, but it's, like I said, especially for those security organizations, it's just not that's just not their top priority. They're focused on making sure that she can't say anything that's else that's damaging to um, to the kind of 
ruling elite. And, you know, what I think is, is kind of especially difficult about that case for them is that she is such a, a relatable international figure. She has a name, she has a face, she has fans around the world. And that's not true of most dissidents in China. You know, the Chinese government is pretty good at, at marginalize, marginalizing them and um, making them irrelevant for, for global audiences. Um, it's, it's something that they've practiced over many decades and, and it's not really possible for them to do that in the case of, of Peng Shui. And I think it makes it a, a kind of particularly thorny challenge for them. Let's talk a little bit more about, you know, business relationships. So what does Wolf Warrior diplomacy really mean for American businesses? Uh, you know, as we have conversations about, um, should we should we continue our efforts in China? We, we, we can't ignore their large uh, uh, population of, of, of purchasers, of buyers yet. Uh, we're concerned about being able to continue supply chains disrupted, um, thinking about other alternatives, but knowing that uh, at least at this point, other alternatives in the world don't uh, hold a candle to what China has developed in terms of efficiencies. Um, what should what do you think American businesses should be thinking about as they ponder uh, a bit of this conundrum in the wake of Wolf Warrior diplomacy? Yeah. I mean, I you know it depends, of course, a, a huge amount on the kind of business that you're you're talking about. I mean, I think what Wolf Warrior diplomacy did was it's you know it, its immediate business implications aren't aren't super clear, but but what it did was to put a human face on a much broader perception that China um, China's intentions were a problem and China's uh, actions were were threatening to the outside world. And it kind of, you know, for a long time, there was this kind of assertive Chinese behavior that was matched with relatively restrained and ameliorative Chinese diplomacy. And now those two things have, have come together and everyone knows what an angry Chinese official looks like. It's a wolf warrior diplomat. And, um, you know, that has helped to harden perceptions of, um, of China as a threat with US politicians, uh, with much of the US public. And I think that that makes, the, the reputational challenges of, of doing business in China much more difficult. Um, you know, this uh, issue of, of, of companies having to check their supply chains, for example, for um, products that are manufactured in, in Xinjiang and the potential repercussions there. Or, you know, in the, in the last administration, I remember Mike Pence calling out, I think, Nike publicly um, and saying that it, it was, um, you know, being too deferential to China and, uh, and, 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 and that kind of thing can obviously cause uh, major PR problems, it can cause investor relation problems, and so that, that reputational thing is going to become, I think, increasingly difficult to, to, to weather, and I guess that the Wolf Warriors um, just make the situation worse, a situation that ultimately stems from Chinese policies. Um, they kind of exacerbate. I think, you know, the other side is that as the two, the two countries um, decouple economically to the extent that that they can and, and and you know this is a process that's being driven by by people in Washington but it's it's also being driven on the the Chinese side um and some of my colleagues at Bloomberg reported the other day that the the ride sharing company Didi was going to be asked to delist in the U.S. because of worries that it, it holds sensitive data that that Americans might get hold of and that could cause problems for China so really both sides are pushing this decoupling and I think what a lot of executives are deciding um, as a result of that is that they're going to be in China for China and then in the world for the rest of the world so maybe maybe they'll be decoupling maybe supply chains will become less integrated most companies can't afford to just ignore the the China market given its growth potential but perhaps uh, perhaps the country will no longer be such a seamlessly integrated part of their supply chains, maybe maybe they will manufacture in China for Chinese consumers, and then the rest of their global supply chain will be separate. And you know, as I said, this is going to play out incredibly differently across different sectors and, and different corporations. But that's that's kind of that's kind of my sense of of, of how things are starting to shake out. Oh, very interesting. Thank you for that answer. Uh, questioner is asking about uh, Taiwan, and that uh, tension has uh, certainly ratcheted up. Uh, and um, 
But who's responsible for that ratcheting up? Is is that American uh, diplomats or American leadership that have uh, pushed that button both in the last administration, but also in this one, right? Um, but or is it part of the wolf warrior strategy? I mean, now now uh, is the time to to strike on this issue. Uh, they're China's less intimidated by the U.S. or the world. I think they probably calculated that no one may come to the rescue of Taiwan should they get more and more aggressive. Uh, is that connected to the you know the the tougher diplomatic um, strain that you've been talking about in your book? Yeah. Um, so, in in some ways, I find it a little bit difficult to get my head around the extent of the, the the worry about the Taiwan issue at the moment. And I think, um, you know, certainly there have been a lot of provocative actions on the on the on the Chinese side in in in, in terms of sending fighter aircraft into the Taiwan's air defense identification zone and you know assertive language. Uh, military training exercise which is which are aimed at um you know launching attacks on um offshore islands near china and it's like oh who, who could that be you know um so th there are plenty of signs that are that are concerning but you know having said that china has been kind of ratchet, ratcheting up the tension for a long long time and trying to put pressure on taiwan i don't think that necessarily means that uh, you know, I think a lot of people in Washington don't necessarily think that means an invasion is imminent. You know, we know from the experience of the British in Gallipoli, to the, the fact that it took the US, you know, many years to, to get ready for the Normandy invasion, that amphibious landings are incredibly difficult. And that that's true of, 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 you know, even the most powerful nations in the world, and it applies to China too. And that if Xi Jinping were to launch an invasion, he would be taking a, a massive risk with um, with China's military and with China's global reputation, but I think a lot of the concern, um, which you know, is that, that there's a lot of validity to, to it as well. It comes from this idea that well, the U.S. just pulled out of Afghanistan. Is that going to tell U.S. allies and especially tell China that uh, perhaps the country doesn't have enough staying power to really stick up for the island? And does this create opportunities for actors around the world from Putin to Xi Jinping to kind of take advantage of, 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 um, of that uh kind of receding nature of, of, of US leadership and, and, and do something provocative in the meantime. I think also a lot of the worry stems from the fact that, um, you know, Chinese politics have always been opaque and, and difficult to read, but under Xi Jinping, that's, that's more the case than ever. His inner circle is small and he, you know, although it's easy to, on paper to make the case of why this would be such a bad move for Xi, he is an incredibly risk tolerant politician. He didn't need to abolish all of the, you know, the term limits and the other political conventions that he's got rid of in China. He could have kind of continued to rule behind the scenes, but for whatever reason, he decided that, no, I want the titles and um, I'm going to write my name into the constitution and, and all of these kind of things. Um, he promised President Obama on the South Lawn of the White House that he wouldn't militarize the South China Sea. He did it anyway. Um, you know, so there we have lots of examples of him kind of having this high tolerance for risk. And I think that's causing a lot of jitters over Taiwan. So, so while I kind of feel like it's hard to make a case for why they would want to do something now. I, I do recognize that just the, the sheer opacity of the Chinese political system makes that hard to make definitive calls on. Uh, thanks. Um, a question from uh, a listener. Uh, do you believe that the US and China are headed toward a Cold War uh, mentality? Are, are we there already? Are we headed that direction? And can anything change that? Can anything change the way it, it, it seems to be moving, that China will become the new Cold War adversary of the United States? Um, I mean, I guess, I guess it depends on your definition of Cold War. I mean, so in some ways, it, it already is a Cold War. Um, but it's it, it, it but it, you know if that's the case it's certainly going to look very very different to the confrontation between the US and the Soviet Union um in that case uh you know the, the Soviet Union 
was relatively autarkic in its approach to economics. It wasn't deeply integrated with the US or the rest of the world and with US allies. Um, China is. China is a crucial trading partner for the United States. It's probably even more important to, to US allies, especially US allies in, in Asia when it comes to, to their economic security. Um, so the chances of countries kind of um, separating into two distinctive global opposing blocks um, I think are pretty small and the the ability of just despite the decoupling that we talked about economically the ability of Chinese and American political elites to truly extricate their economies from each other is pretty limited um, and you know that the, they would increase costs for example for U.S. consumers in a way that that might turn out not to be um, politically palatable, just to cite one example. And so, so maybe it will be a, a, a Cold War, but, but it's going to look incredibly different. The two countries are going to be much more integrated and intertwined. Um, and uh, I think that, uh, that yeah, the, the chances of these kind of two blocks emerging are small. And what, what we've seen in in the last couple of years and even even months is the emergence of a much more um, fragmented constellation of partnerships around the US and around China. So if you think of, you know, the US has been working more closely with NATO on China issues. It's It's been working with EU, individual European governments. It's been working with ASEAN, but not pushing too far on that because those countries don't like to really confront China directly. It's worked with quad partners, uh, you know, India, Australia, Japan. It's worked with the Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance. It just launched this new um, partnership with uh, the UK and Australia to, to provide Australia with um, nuclear submarine technology, the AUKUS Pact. That's a, that's a messy kind of overlapping set of partnerships that really don't look anything like the Eastern Bloc and the Western Bloc. So maybe it's a Cold War, but it's not the Cold War. That's really a helpful distinction. I appreciate that. Well, we have a, uh, many of our colleges and universities uh, in West Michigan, and, and um, I'm sure that's true coast to coast in the US, really benefited by educational partnerships and students going back and forth from university. And of course, a lot of that has been uh, truncated and uh, does, uh, does this new uh, Chinese diplomatic posture allow for that kind of exchange? Will we be, will we be seeing um, uh, increased educational changes again, or are we sort of locked down where, where we are at this point in that situation? No, it's not. It's not a topic where I have a huge amount of um, of expertise, and so I, I wouldn't want to get into to policy predictions. But I think um, you know, in the short term, China's um, approach to COVID, where which has made it incredibly difficult to to leave and then re-enter the country or for for foreigners to visit for any reason at all, including the Olympics um, is going to be a, a major challenge to that. And then, of course, you have um, concerns about um, some types of, of educational partnership with the PRC and whether there are national security implications, you know, are uh, and, and, and again, I, I, I you know, you could, we could be really careful when we discuss this to say that, like, there are many, many Chinese students who come overseas and most of them are not doing anything remotely suspect, but, but, the, but there have been activities uncovered which have involved industrial espionage or reporting back to the embassy, um, the Chinese embassy about, about um, the movements of people here that have caused real concerns from, from policymakers. And so I think the two countries are gonna have to figure out um, an approach to educational exchange, which is, um, you know, which works with their COVID policies and their border policies, and also um, uh, reflect some of these these kind of growing national security concerns. I think I think that's going to be pretty difficult, but it's it's also quite hard to imagine how the huge student populations of these two, uh, the world's two biggest economies, wouldn't have contact with each other. And I think you know many institutions, as you said, feel like um, they would be. Um, uh, 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 they, they, they would lose out on something very important if they weren't able to continue doing that. So we'll see how it plays out. 
Peter, we've really appreciated your time and, and uh, the, the uh, very interesting conversation. This has been quite enlightening. One last question about uh, the Olympics. China mm. is hosting, and that's coming up in February. Uh, given what we've talked about and given some of the things that you've learned in your book and you've shared with us in your book, um, what uh, what should we expect? Uh, I know there's there's now been some discussion with that the U.S. Uh, won't boycott, but not send its major leaders mm. to watch the Olympics. There's some posturing posturing going around back and forth. But is there anything that you expect to see that's that's uh, that's different or reflective of what you've talked about in your book at the Olympics in February? I, I mean, I don't know what will happen in terms of the U.S. Um, sending officials. I think that the, you know, the Biden administration is certainly very, very sensitive about being labeled weak on China. And so that will be a major consideration for them, I think, when they decide what kind of representation they do send. Um, I think that um, the kind of broader point I would make about the Olympics is that when we think of, of China hosting in 2008, um, Chinese diplomats in the in the run up to that were were very effective at, at, at charming foreign counterparts and and kind of winning friends for the the country, um, but that that came alongside this much broader set of um, of policies where China was opening up its economy, uh, its political system. Maybe it wasn't liberalizing, but there was certainly hope that one day it might move in that direction. Um, and you, that made it possible for, for foreign elites to kind of buy into a rosier picture of China's future. And that made that kind of charm offensive style of diplomacy, I think, more compelling to outsiders. Um, and that, that, that kind of policy basis for, for getting closer to China and for China's reputation um, improving is not there as, as the country moves to host this set of Olympics. The country is, is kind of closed down. Many people are extremely pessimistic about the, um, the chances for economic liberalization in, in, in China. Um, I think no one is expecting political liberalization mainly because Xi Jinping is exceptionally explicit about his desire to avoid that. Um, and of course, there's no kind of charm offensive going on with Chinese diplomats. They're busy uh, shouting at people and kind of acting like wolf warriors. And so the, the, the kind of broader political diplomatic policy context that, that allowed the 2008 Beijing Olympics to be such a watershed for China, th those factors are just not there this time. And so I think it's going to be an incredibly different experience, which really speaks to an incredibly different type of China. Peter, thank you so much. We want to uh, let you go. And uh, we have really enjoyed this conversation. And folks, we're going to archive this conversation with Peter. It'll be on our YouTube channel, uh, which you can find at World Michigan on YouTube. And we encourage you to tell others about it and to have them check that out as well. And remind you of Peter's book, uh, China's Civilian Army, fascinating read and available now wherever good books on global education are available. Uh, we are um, almost done with our programming for this uh, season, and our last program will be a week from today on Monday, December 6th, when the Santa Fe Council on International Relations has um, invited us to be a partner with a conversation with, um, it's, it's uh, Caddy Martin, who is the author of a brand new book on German Chancellor Angela Merkel. It's titled The Chancellor, The Remarkable Odyssey of Angela Merkel. And um, we'll be able to uh, check in with uh, the Santa Fe Council and witness that conversation on Monday, December 6th at 7 p.m. Eastern. And look to our worldmichigan.org website and our social media to find out how you can register for that fee program. Peter, thank you so much again. Best wishes to you and your Thanks. family all this season.